Uh, all right. So I'm Patrick. I'm going to be talking on building high-performance web applications. Um, so I was talking to people before lunch and you know in the morning sessions, and this one question that came up all along was, is performance really that important? I mean, how does a one-second delay really change the world? I mean, the world is not going to come to an end. Uh, but if it, it, it's kind of uh, contextual, right? So it's not that every time a one second delay is actually causing a lot of problem, but in situations where you're an e-commerce website, a one second delay would probably set you back 10% of your accounts would drop off, right? That impacts your revenues. So uh, there's been a lot of research, Amazon, eBay, Google, and all these guys have done research and said, performance really matters, right? So this is what I'm gonna be talking about. Uh, so I'm Karthik. I work at PayPal India, I'm a performance engineer. For those of you who don't know what PayPal is all about, we are part of eBay. I hope you guys at least know what eBay is all about. Uh, so, uh, I mean, there's a little bio there. You can read that. I'm Karthik Dot on Twitter, so please keep updated to each other. Right, so I was talking about PayPal. So PayPal happens to be one of the best places to work in India, and it's also ranked number six in technology companies. This is just me bragging about my company. Sorry. Uh, and also, we be uh, ranked as the most innovative company in the finance industry. Anyway, so skip the boring talk. Right, so building high performance web applications. So, uh, there's been a lot of uh, performance, is not a brand new topic, it's been there for a long time now. There have been some set best practices. The industry said this is how you do things. And, you know, uh, everyone. Uh, who's new in this industry would say, hey, go look up Yahoo's performance guidelines. This is the first thing that people do. And they read a bunch of things, you know, and it all boils down to something like this. It says, reduce HTTP request, do not request. Okay, it says, don't have extra images. If you want, if you have images, use price. If you have a lot of sales, you have to minify and concatenate it. At the end of it, all they're saying is, reduce the number of HTTP requests. Right? And there's a lot of variations. You have image price, you have CSS, JavaScript, integration, blah, blah, blah. And all those kind of things. And the other magic bullet or the silver bullet is use CDN, use Akamai, use Amazon Cloud, and you know, things will just speed up. You know, this is like this huge misconception that the moment you start using a CDN, your site is fast. Right? Uh, that's what the assumption is. And uh, it's not really so. Uh, there are, again, corner cases to this, but. <laughs> Uh, performance really is not, you read a bunch of articles and say this is how I'm going to make my web application. It is actually implementing these trial and error, taking on what works for you, what doesn't, and that's how you do it. So I'm not going to be talking about all these things. You can as well go and read Yahoo's performance guidelines. They've done a good job with this. So I'm not going to repeat this detail. So seriously, that is not enough, okay? You cannot do the same thing which has been there for 10 years, 15 years. Yahoo said it, Google has said it, Amazon has said it. That is not enough. We need to do something more uh, to actually improve the performance. Uh, so these traditional ways of doing things not going to work. It will work. I'm not saying it's not a solution. I'm saying that this is not the only solution. Okay, there are better ways to do this. Uh, why? So web pages are getting more complex. This is like our, you know, Bollywood movies, more or less. You know, in 1960s you had this black and white things with no magic mystery happening on the screen. Everything was pretty static. Right, and then came Amitabh Bachchan in the 90s, and there was some magic, I'm a disco dancer, and all that shit. Something, some, and now you see, you have, God knows what's happening in the movie, there's one guy, guys in the middle of nowhere, and then somebody else is caught. Random things, right? Essentially, the fact being that web pages on the internet today are getting more and more complex, right? This is how it was in 1995, and you, it's pretty obvious, everything's getting a lot more complex. And we cannot do the same thing that we've been doing all along to make this work. So I'm going to be talking a little more uh, on a little bit advanced, not really advanced, pretty simple things to do on how you can actually make an impact to the user experience that your users see when they access your website. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about lazy loading. Okay, don't load until you need to. Uh, prevent frontend spot, essentially being single point of failure. You have something on your website that dies and you have side of it, you know, blast. It's just gone. It's not there. Uh, early flush. Uh, chunk responses. This is one of my favorites. Uh, asynchronous script loading. Uh, this is again kind of hot in the industry right now. Everyone talks about async and all that. And Google Speedy, up and coming. It's not there yet, but I'll uh, briefly touch upon this and see how you can actually leverage that. 
Right, so I was uh, talking about content spot. I'm just going to uh, try and get it on this. So how many of you guys actually run a website? You have a blog or you have something? Uh, you have Twitter buttons, Facebook buttons. You have tweet this blog post of mine like this. I'm sure if you guys don't have it, you don't, you're not running a blog. Trust me, a blog is not without social ego. Okay? So if you have a blog and you don't have these icons, go home, put it, and then continue with it. So you, I'm sure you guys have this uh, Twitter buttons on the website, right? I'm just going to pick on Twitter because it has the habit of going down almost every other time. Right? Twitter failed you. It goes down. So what happens to your website if Twitter goes down? Then you have a simple tweet button. I'm just going to play a video. I don't want to do a live demo because things can go very wrong. Right? So this is how it would be. So this is the normal, that's Twitter being down. Seriously, nothing happened in 20 seconds. Now it starts moving. Okay, basically what happens here is, you know, you have a Twitter button, you have embedded your HTML code in it. Now your browser tries to contact with the servers, they're down. It retries. Okay, there's a timeout. It keeps retrying until the timeout happens. And because of that fact, it stops everything else on that page. And then finally when it realizes Twitter is no longer alive, it starts showing the page. Now this is what I call front end spot, single point of failure. Now, uh, this is happening today in more so ways because of the fact that in 1995-2000s we had a website which was completely managed by us. But today if you look at it, we have a lot of third party widgets, third party javascripting tools, right? You have all kinds of buttons and all kinds of things. One of them can actually bring your site down, <coughs> right? So you guys can actually go to this link on this slide, I'll be sharing the slides later on. Uh, this, this is the way how you can test your website to see how this failure happens on your side or not. Go home, check this. And if, you, if you're not doing well, if Twitter goes down, your site still stays up, that's really good. And that's what you're trying to do here. So how do we get this? Is by doing lazy load of Twitter buttons. Show your main content first, and then show your Twitter button. Twitter button is not your content, right? Your content is your article, your blog post, or whatever. So show that later. So that's lazy load. And there are multiple ways of doing it, just Google it. Right, so lazy loading is what I was talking about. Uh, load scripts on demand, uh, progressive rendering. Show what's needed, right? Show your blog post. Uh, show your, uh, you know, fancy uh, header typing and all that. Don't show your ads, okay? Ads come later. Don't show your Twitter button. Now these are the step, progressive rendering. So first show your content. Once that's there, the user is seeing this, interacting with your content. Then start loading ads, which is whatever. Right, so you load that in, in a lazy fashion. And the next thing is render content above the fold. Above the fold is essentially what is visible without having to scroll vertically, right? So if you can show this much, the user sees, okay, I have half a page to read right now. I will start looking at this. And by the time he actually decides to scroll, the rest of the content is there, right? Don't load the entire thing. And then user, it is, there's a long process for him to start interacting with this. So show the about the fold content and then jump to how you can do below the fold. Right, uh, so internet users have this insanely faulty perception of time, right? Uh, let's say this is the actual load time, okay? When I am actually browsing this website, I feel that this is 15 percent slower. So say for instance it takes 10 seconds, I feel it's taking like 11 and a half seconds. That's my perception, okay? And now if I go home and tell my mom or dad, it's completely different. Okay, I'm telling that this is like 35 percent slower than what it actually was. So I'm telling this site took 13 seconds, not 10. 10 was the actual. When I first thought about it, I said 11. I went home. I tell the other people it's 13, right? So this is the perception. Uh, this the reason why I'm telling you this is if your site is not fast and your users go and tell their friends, they never going to come to your site, right? And this is again how important is performance because it spreads word of mouth. You all know what the slowest sites on planet are, IRCTC performance is, right? You know this, everyone knows IRCTC will never load when you want to book a ticket. People give up on it and that's loss of business, right? If you are running IRCTC, I hope you would go and fix it. 
I, I hope they summon for my STC, but I'm not sure. So this is the problem, right? The perception. You go home, you you convey a completely different image of what actually happened. Uh, okay. So this comes to yeah. I can't show you. Is the reverse theory also possible? So let's say they perceive the slightly loading faster, they go back and tell the slightly even faster to the location. Yeah, no. I, I, I think that will actually benefit you, right? So people really like fast sites. So if your site loads really fast, I'm sure you won't tell your friend, hey, the site is so fast. It's always comparative. You would compare with the peers in that industry. So let's take for instance, I'm picking on peer trip. I go home and say, here it is much right, here it is much faster than IRCTC, right? That's my comparison point. But when you talk about IRCTC alone, the slow side, you would say the stakes were ever, right? So having a really good fast website is pretty good. Uh, so coming back to my perception point. Uh, so how do you make sure that the users feel that something is happening, the perceived performance, right? Your site might actually take five seconds, but if it starts showing things at one second, two seconds, three seconds, the user will actually feel, hey, something is happening on the screen. I can go and do something, right? Don't wait for five seconds and then dump it on the user's face. Do it in progressive manner. Uh, if you're a PHP guy, all you have to do is this one line of code, PHP flush. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you how this actually works. And I'm sure all of your websites have CSS, JavaScript images, and all these kind of things, right? Uh, now load these things. Uh, if you look at the typical ways of doing things, Yahoo's performance guidelines would say CSS at the top, JavaScript at the bottom of the page, okay, and everything else in between. And it says lazy load images and all that. Uh, what I'm trying to do here is if your website is a backend intensive system, start dumping the static assets first. Okay, don't wait for your backend to actually generate the complete response. If your website takes like two seconds, there's a lot of DB intensive stuff happening in the backend. Skip all that. Your CSS in JavaScript is not dependent on what happens in the DB, right? It's essentially user specific. So if you can push out the CSS in JavaScript the earlier, the better. Right? The browser will start downloading it. It won't do anything with it. It'll start downloading it. So this is uh, this is early flush chunk responses. So I'm going to show a demo how this would actually look in real life. Uh, sorry. Okay. So this is how Yahoo does it. So they have this Yahoo homepage. Right? So they actually flush after the top navigation on the site. So if you actually hit yahoo.com on a slow connection, the first thing you would see is a search box, which is, again, the most important thing for Yahoo, right? And then they flush this entire thing, one shot. This is more or less above the fold to an extent. They might be a little bit that scrolls downwards, never mind. And then at the end is when they actually think about doing the footer, right? So they flush at regular intervals. And the user will see this thing first, then this, then this. It's never everything in one shot. It's always at regular intervals. So I'm making an example uh, on, okay. One of my, uh, uh, we recently launched a product, PayPal here. So I've just taken that website as an example and to show you how it would look on a comparative basis if you do a flush and if you don't do a flush. So I hope you saw the difference. So this is the early flush, normal way of doing things. It's almost like a two second improvement. Uh, this works for us because uh, I, the, the reason I'm telling you this is all these solutions are not silver bullets. It's not something you go home and implement it, your site is like 50% faster. These are very dependent on the kind of website you run. This works in a situation where you're a backend intensive system. So we are one. So I actually flush the navigation at first. It has the JavaScript and CSS. The browser actually downloads it. The moment it gets the HTML, it's there, right? Over here is, is, is more of a gradual process, the normal way of doing things. CSS top, JavaScript and bottom. So if you can do an early flush, if it works for your system, you're a backend intensive system, do this. Yeah. I have a question Okay. So, uh, okay. This question was in when you're using jQuery, for instance, right? You have these different browser events on load and all these different events. 
which you depend on to do certain things on the website, right? Uh, yeah, I mean elements in the same. Exactly. So say for instance you want to change the color of a link item, list item, whatever, something. So you are actually, you, you fire this at on load and this is when you go and change it, right? Now, this again brings me back to what I was saying. Show the things that really matter to the user first, okay? You would normally do this jQuery things for kind of animations for a much better experience. But if you can actually show it in one shot and then decorate it later, go ahead and do it. And there's no difference to the actual browser <coughs> performance over here. When you do an early flush, the only thing here is it starts downloading early. It's not executing. Now, JavaScript is two things, download, execute. So when you do an early flush, it will start downloading. And it will not execute until you actually call for it. At some point, right? Download even if you're not executing. Exactly. So your jQuery is there. Your Lightbox. Exactly. So suppose you have a Lightbox, and the moment you actually click, it'll be there, right? It's not changing that behavior. What is changing is downloading of the jQuery itself. Yeah. So that's where your early flush helps. CSS goes out first. JavaScript goes out. This early flush behavior. So this works on IE6 and above. So if I6 works for you, it will work anywhere. Now, there are, again, now what I'm, this does not mean that go and implement. Uh, so, chunk responses have an issue with the fact that if you're a PHP guy or if you're a Ruby guy or whatever, and there's some error that happens on your code, right? Normally, you would do a redirect, redirect to error page somewhere in the bottom, right? Say, for instance, you have a header footer, and, and in the footer something goes wrong, you do a redirect to error.html or whatever. It will not work. Simply because the HTML output is already being sent. If you look at the way HTTP works, the moment your headers are sent, nothing else can change the response. So you cannot do a redirect after sending the output. So things like that won't work when you do a chunk response. So what you actually need to do is redirect via JavaScript. So there are obvious uh, things that you need to weigh down and think if it works or not. It depends on how your backend system is actually architected. It has to go into design. Exactly. So, exactly. So this is not something that you can go and implement straight away. It needs a lot of research and analysis to how you structure your page, how your backend system generates the response. But if you can implement it, you will see substantial gains. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. So I move on. So the next thing that I talk, want to talk about is asynchronous JavaScript loading and polyfills. So I'm sure all of you guys want to do HTML5 stuff. You want to have geolocation on the page. You want to do all kinds of stuff, right? Now, IE6 does not support geolocation. IE7 does not support geolocation. Firefox 3 does not support geolocation. So how do you actually give a consistent experience to your users while loading things on demand? So my favorite library is yepnope.js. You can go Google this up. Essentially, what it says is it tests if your browser supports geolocation. Okay, if it says you load the normal way of doing things, you call your normal JavaScript. If it doesn't, you actually call a polyfill. Now, polyfill is essentially a wrapper for a feature that the browser does not support. So it, it, it's kind of like another bunch of code that runs. So you can actually do this. So for IE, you can give a different experience, and for Firefox and Chrome, you can give a different experience. The benefit here being you're no longer stuck to the lowest common denominator. Right? Just because your users are IE6 does not mean you don't give your Chrome users a good experience. So this is what you can actually do with async uh, and polyfills and all that. Now, uh, another uh, step here is, I'm sure if you read a bunch of things, they say load jQuery from Google CDN, uh, right? Uh, or it may say load the Twitter widget from Twitter CDN or whatever, something like that. Now what happens if Google goes down? Hypothetical situation, okay? You would see the same front end spot that you saw earlier the page will not load because Google itself is down. I know it's a big ask, but it can happen, right? So in this situation, what's actually happening is, it'll try to load from the Google CDN. If it does not you know, get loaded, it times out, you actually load from your local copy of jQuery. It's a fallback, right? So you can do this. All this is supported by Yepno. So go home, check it out. There's a lot of things that you can do with this to give your users a much better experience. Uh, resource preloading. Now, when you launch a new website, right, you have a completely new redesigned website. And today is this uh, dull looking website, and tomorrow is all flashy, lots of images, lots of JavaScript stuff. 
and the the moment you launch it tomorrow your users are going to come and say hey your site is really slow simply because the cache is not filled right it's fresh content you have to pre launch so you have fresh content there what you can actually do with this is day before your launch day or a week before your launch day start filling the users cache with your new images your new css your new java so on the launch day you actually have a really fast website right so this is cool because today you can actually launch your website and then everyone will come calling on you and say your site takes like 5 seconds to load but if you can actually preload load all this the week before your launch you will get a really good experience so again sorry how do they get that in the cache So, um, okay, his question is how do this uh, preloaded resources get into cache? It's simple. The moment you start, the browser starts downloading an asset, it will get cached. So in this situation, yeah. So in this situation, all it's doing is actually downloading jQuery and keeping in the cache. Sometime later, you actually reference this file. It's there in the cache. That's it. That's all it is doing. Okay. So the key idea of all these uh, things that I talked about is. Download all the scripts in parallel as soon as possible, and execute them in the order that you want. So I'm saying decouple download execution. They're two different things. Don't do at the same time. Okay. So uh, so I took the async JavaScript loading. The Fnob supports it, and I took it on the same sample that I showed you, my default Geo website, and see how it looks on that. Okay, over here it's not much of a difference. Like a second difference, uh, still pretty good uh, of a you know performance improvement. But if you have a website that is intensive on JavaScript and CSS, this will help you. Now this is a very simple website. It's a landing page. There's not much happening here. But if you are this huge portal, this will help you a lot. So you can try and do this again. I'm not actually going through the code and see how this works. I'm just giving you some kind of reference so that you can go back home, play around with all these things. Right. So the next thing that I want to talk about is Google Speedy, uh, which I know most of people here are there for. I mean, same reason. And nobody wanted to need to talk about all this bullshit that I talked about till now. Half the people in this room are probably there for Google Speedy. So I'm just going to straight jump to that. So Google Speedy, this fancy little thing from Google, uh, they call it HTTP 2.0, step up from HTTP 1.1. Uh, so what it actually allows you to do is all jargon here. Uh, multiplex streams, essentially using one TCP connection. So, if you actually look at the classical ways of doing performance, they say have a CDN and then call it CDN one dot xyz dot com and CDN two dot xyz dot com. You shard your resources. You load CSS from one domain. You load CSS JavaScript from one more domain. Reason being, the browser can download them in parallel. Okay, this is a hack. It was there because at that point of time we didn't have all these cool little things, and now it's there. So everything can happen on one single TCP connection. The advantage being you no longer have to face the issue of TCP uh, TCP slow start. Essentially, TCP when it starts off, it takes lower bandwidth and progressively increases the bandwidth capacity. So you actually have a much higher chance of getting a full use of the bandwidth available than just throwing off multiple TCP connections. So Google Speedy actually does that. Uh, then it does request prioritization. Simply meaning, CSS is more important than JavaScript. You need CSS to show what's on the page. JavaScript is for the behavior. It's okay if a light box doesn't load, but it's not okay if the colors and the layout is all messed up, right? So priority. CSS gets more priority than JavaScript, and you can actually define it yourself. You can say jQuery is more important than my some other light box code or whatever. You can actually define it. So the browser will prioritize your request depending on its bandwidth. Network resources or whatever. Today you have no control over this. It's just random, right? So this will be allowed again. Now header compression may not make much difference. Uh, every time you hit a request to the server, right? There's a request header and there's a response header. Now this is like a whole lot of text which goes in there. It takes like browser mind type and all those kind of things. A lot of text. It's almost like 10 kb up and down. So it actually compresses that to almost 85 percent of its text. So it's like 15 5. Around 2 kb or something. Uh, it does that, and server push. The server can actually push things on demand. This again goes back to me saying, if you have a new website launching, you can, the server has a control now. It's no longer your asynchronous yapnote.js preloading things. The server can say, hey, next week I'm going to launch a new cool website. 
put all this on the client side put it there yeah so uh, if you talk, when i was talking previously i was talking about it being on the client side client is client essentially knows that you are launching a new website again it does not make sense in the real world but you as a web developer knows that new launch is coming up you push things ahead but over <laughs> here you are the server then you can actually push things to all your users without them having to ask for it it's a difference right uh, so google speed allows you to do that so uh, so google did some tests and even we did it so and we actually found that google speed on a very intensive resource intensive website okay can actually show you somewhere between 45% to 55% improvement essentially halving your load times 5 seconds is 2 and a half seconds 2 seconds is a second you can do that now this will not again work for all the websites out there it will work on websites which are resource intensive meaning uh, websites which are more like amazon and ebay and you know which have a lot of images and all these kind of things it will work for them it will it will give them a substantial gain 50% or whatever but if you are a small website you can still see 10 to 20% improvement again my point being just because of the fact that you are using speedy does not mean you see a 50% improvement again it's not a silver bullet but it will definitely improve things and today there's not much of a browser support to it it's just chrome and uh, firefox 11 plus which supports but this is under review by ielf so they're actually looking at making this the draft http 2.0 so things will definitely improve maybe by the end of this year or next year things might be completely different uh, okay so this was about speedy now how many of you guys have actually used firebox or chrome developer tools and run Vyslow and space speed and all those kind of things it gives you a nice score it says your Vyslow score is 80 or 85 and then you go hell you know hell breaks loose you go on optimizing optimizing you get a 95 Vyslow score and you're happy right you say i've done my optimizations done but in the real world it's not the same right again this may not apply to everyone over here if you're a big company if you have a lot of traffic on your website start monitoring how it is for the user <coughs> that's real user monitoring okay uh, so monitor in production don't run your vice loose course and be satisfied there actually go into production and capture metrics from there and then see how it works reason being this okay now this is what happens when you hit yahoo.com to what in the end of it there's so many steps involved most people don't even realize so there's dns issues there's cache issues there's proxy issues you have javascript execution issues and browser issues and all those kind of things that come up between your and to the onload event right there's a lot of things that happen now your vice low score is on your local machine it tells you what it is from you as a user what's the perceived performance right but in the real world you have a lot of things that come up in between somebody might be on bsnl broadband and somebody might be on some weird internet connection right so things are different to them now how do you optimize somebody might be on a really good fancy browser like chrome and somebody might be using an old browser now the fact is you as a website owner you cannot say that i'm going to ignore i6 guys or i7 okay you can ignore i6 but at least don't ignore i7 and i8 because they're still real world users right so you cannot just pick so you need to understand how is your application behaving for all these guys in the real world how is it impacting people in India and how is it in China or how is it in US, right? So you need to capture all these metrics and that is how you go to the next level of optimization. You will automatically figure out what works in the US, what works in the India and you can optimize your application on a geo-specific way of doing it. So to this, I would actually recommend uh, a tool called Boomerang uh, by Yahoo. It's a simple JavaScript um, code and when you do that, it has like a beacon, it sends back data to some server and it sends you all this. It tells you when your doc document complete happened, your response times, your time to first byte, uh, your DNS issues, whatever. It tells you all these things, sends it back to your server, you can do the crunching, you can do the analysis. Now, if you're not someone who has the capacity to run this kind of system, uh, okay, I'm just gonna, I'll talk about that. So, why get real world data? Okay, you need to get across geographies, browser types that I talked about, and you can actually roll out optimizations specific to a region. 
So we do that a lot. Uh, at eBay, in the US, you have you are actually near to the eBay servers, so things are much better if you are in the US. But the moment you step out and you are actually hitting eBay India, uh, your server response is coming all the way from US under the oceans. It comes finally to India. There's a lot of latency there. Uh, um, so that happens, right? So you can actually optimize. So we have local CDN in India, which kind of delay this. I mean, improve the performance. How do we know all this? Simply because we actually measured in the real world. We found that Indians have a lower, uh, I mean, much worse performance than the US users, and we optimize for them, right? It's, this is not your vice low score. This is actually real world data. Uh, so when if you do this kind of monitoring, uh, what kind of things are you actually be tracking? Uh, get the geographic information, very important. Get performance in India, get the performance in US, get the performance in Europe, Japan, whatever. And then get 95%, 90 75% and 50% load times, percentile. Essentially meaning 95% of my users see the website in 5 seconds. Okay? And 90% see it in 4 seconds. The point here is 95% tile is supposed to be your highest load time, your threshold. If you have a business which says my deadline is 5 seconds, 95% of your users should be able to see within 5 seconds. And as you go lower, 50% is probably your Chrome and Firefox users who have much better browsers target a much lower load time. So maybe 2 seconds, 3 seconds. So capture all these metrics from your real world data and see it should be decreasing down as you go down. 95% users should see 5 seconds, 50% should see 2 seconds, right? So capture this data. Uh, get the browser info, what version of browser, what blah blah blah, whatever. Okay, and the DNS thing. Now, if you cannot use Boomerang or you cannot use a bunch of other open source tools in this space, uh, you can actually use Google Anal Analytics. It has a page speed tracking tool. You just enable it, it'll actually capture speed metrics for you. It's a simple JavaScript snippet again. Or you can check out New Relic, which is another uh, commercial solution. Uh, it's pretty good. You can even try that out. Right. So I'm pretty much wrapping up. So how do you actually improve the performance? Play around with all these things. Emphasis being on play around and not implement all this. Okay. Play around, figure out what works for you, change things, and roll it on in production. Measure it there and see if it works. If it works, good. Otherwise, roll back. Don't look at your vice versa scores and be happy. Okay. Uh, again, basically reduce the pain of your users. Okay. Don't make them wait five seconds to see your website. Make it as fast as you can possibly make it, and give them the insanely awesome, super experience. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff happening in this industry. Uh, performance, even though it sounds like a really small thing to do, uh, there's a lot of research going on. Google Speedy is uh, probably the biggest well-known solution here. But there's a lot of things happening in this space. Read Twitter, read blogs, you have a lot of stuff. You can find a lot more on this. Uh, you can reach out to me, again, by your information. I'll share the slides later. So, questions. Right. So this question is apart from the data that Viselow gives you and the optimization it suggests, what extra benefit do you get out of real user monitoring? Now, this is actually uh, I'll try and give you a good use case here. So at eBay, we actually had this issue uh, where in Israel. There was this proxy server sitting there. So when a request comes from the US, it takes that request, it passes through that proxy and comes to India or wherever, APAC, right? And there was something wrong with the proxy. We never knew, right? Because of the fact that it was entering this network, there was a lot of latencies. And simply because we did real user monitoring, we actually found out people, the users who crossed that proxy and beyond get this low performance. We actually figured out that issue is the proxy itself and we changed our networking to the fact that it does not go that good, right? So all these things are only possible when you do a real user monitoring. This may not, as a front-end developer, uh, it may not make much sense to be very honest to do real user monitoring, but you still want to know what kind of browsers your user use, uh, what optimizations you can apply on them, and change things. Uh, again, uh, do not have a least common denominator way of doing things. If you have 20% of your users on IE7, give them a slightly lower experience and give the Chrome users a really good experience. So that is what you can do as a front-end developer. Measuring the trade-off between 
the browser usage and the regional usage and whatever and then deciding what needs to be done. Okay. So, So this question is again, how did you actually identify the root cause? If I just summarize, yeah. yeah? So uh, again, now in the, in the internet, right? Uh, in the real world, there is lots of things that happen between the initial request from the server, I mean the response, and by the time it reaches you. Uh, your, if you are in China, for instance, uh, your great firewall will actually strip out everything in between it, remote Twitter, Facebook, and all that, and you get this really stripped down version. And if you don't do real user monitoring, you have no clue what Chinese users see, right? Unless you are within China, and you probably are not. So um, again, these use cases are uh, probably not something that applies to each one of those here. Uh, it, it probably applies to uh, big orgs which have uh, which have a global presence. But keep this in mind because when the fact is when your business scales and when you move out, you need to have this data to figure out what the users are actually experiencing, uh, and that will help you with all kinds of course, a root cause analysis will only be possible when you have real data. Okay, so he's again uh, coming back to uh, CDN and Nectinic. So when you do a local machine testing, right, on your browser or your dev box, uh, what happens is you probably are uh, your DNS system, so you have a DNS cache on your OS. It is already cached to DNS entries. Okay? And uh, for instance, your browser may have cache, but you probably have control FI and be able to cache and do all kinds of things. But the fact is, this is established to, to the network. The, the biggest latency on the internet is not your front end or your back end, it's the network. Mm -hmm. Right? So, uh, if, and that will not be shown by a network code or your firewall or whatever. Because you don't have any actionable data from it. It will tell you the latency from the server to you, but it will not tell you what would a user in India or what would a user in China experience. Again, uh, this essentially real user monitoring makes sense when you are a global company uh, and also makes sense when you are trying to give different experiences with different browsers. That's all okay. It may not apply again anywhere. Uh, we use it a lot for AV testing. Yeah, that's again correct. So he basically said the same thing, right? Uh, if if you actually capture your say for instance your e-commerce website, you can actually see the conversion from home page to checkout to completing a transaction or whatever. So all this is again really easy. Uh, monitoring is uh, 24 7. That's it. More or less. Okay. Wait. Okay, uh, so when it comes to mobile, uh, there is a completely different way of optimizing things. That means if you take mobile Safari for instance on the iPhone or iPad, it has a cache resource size of 20 times. Okay, meaning if you have an asset, a JavaScript or CSS, if the file size is beyond 25k, the Safari is not going to cache it. Right? So that has a completely different solution. You cannot generalize desktop versus mobile. Uh, I haven't really done much research on it to be honest, but the fact I know is uh, when you're looking at a mobile browser, there's a lot of lot more network latencies if you're browsing on each for instance, right? So network plays a much bigger role there, and the source size is the cacheability of the resource is also very very good. Uh, desktop browser pretty much catches everything that's thrown at it, but a mobile browser does not. So you need to again architect your application in a way that works. Uh, I don't really have any insights on it. Any practical uh, implementation? Okay, uh, practical implementation. It's live on Google and Twitter today. Okay. Uh, we did a pilot at eBay. Uh, it was there for like two, three days. We switched on speedy for a while to see how it is actually working. Uh, at eBay, we actually saw on the home page, the listing home page, 
we actually see uh, and the world should improve and tell the response time there forty to fifty percent on the eBay homepage, which is a huge thing for us. Uh, today it's just on Chrome and Firefox, not a big deal, but we are actually thinking of going live with this because even in these twenty five percent of users which are Chrome and Firefox today, if that results in a higher conversion for us, it essentially impacts the bottom line. So uh, a lot of companies are rolling out. By the end of this year, we are looking at supports from a lot of browsers. So this is essentially a chicken and egg problem. <coughs> Today we don't have browsers supporting it, we don't have CDNs and the, all the other network players supporting it. But a near or so things will fall in place and you'll see a lot more production use cases. But you can still go ahead and deploy it simply because CD is backwards compatible. Uh, if your browser does not support CD, it will fall back, it'll fall back to HTTP one browser. So which is cool, right? You don't have to worry about how to manage that. Okay, so this question was the difference between so Google is the initial proposal of Speedy, but Microsoft came up and said hey, let's have some more fixes to this, and they said this is my recommendation. Uh, I haven't again gone back and studied all this, but uh, the fact that from our analysis we feel that Speedy as it stands today, Google's implementation is really good. Uh, Maybe Microsoft implementation will add a lot of value. They talk to mobile, uh, and uh, we haven't done much space on that. I mean, much research, simply because on the mobile we don't do a web test. We actually have native apps, so we're not really concerned with that part of uh, business. So that's something that's for again the community to go and figure out how speedy works in the mobile space and how they get performance there. It actually has the way it is right now. It will improve things by a bit. Simply because when you have one connection uh, on CD and you actually use your complete network bandwidth that's there for you, things will automatically improve. Uh, today, if you actually look at the five requests, all of them are DTP slow start, and the network sensor will be really slow, and you see much higher latencies. So, CD will obviously improve things to what extent? I'm not sure in that space. It's a different game altogether, mobile and desktop. Yep, okay, thanks guys. Thanks. Thanks.